ओके लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड भद्रम करणे बिहि शून्याम देवाः भद्रम पश्येम अक्षबिहि रेजत्राः स्थिरै रंगैर् तुष्टुवां सस्तनु बिहि व्यशेम देवहितं यदायुः स्वस्तिनः इन्द्रो वृद्रश्रवाः स्वस्तिनः पूषा विश्ववेदाः स्वस्तिनः तार्क्षो अरिष्टनेमिहि स्वस्तिनो बृहस्पतिर् ददातु यो अन्तः प्रविश्य ममवाच इमां प्रशुप्तां संजीवयति अखिलशक्तिदर स्वदाम्ना अन्यांष्ट हस्तचरणश्रवणत्वगादीन प्राणान नमो भगवते पुरुषुभ्रीमदानन्द तीर्थेन्दुरुनो हृदम्बरे यद्वचश्चन्द्रिका स्वान्त संतापं विनिकृन्तति पदवाक्य प्रमाण ज्ञान प्रणम्य शिरसा गुरून या करिष्ये यथा बोधं विष्णु तत्व विनिर्णयं सो गुड आफ्टरनून एव्रीवन so welcome to the ninth session on chandogya upanishad uh, and as you all know you have spent a good 3 uh, to 4 months having a good background and introduction to the chandogya chapter 6 and we are heading towards the ninth session and uh, to me it doesn't sound like it's a coincidence because we are doing the ninth session and we are going to start off doing the discussions on the nine examples of um, the famous um shruti that uddalaka gives nine illustrations to bring forth some fundamental philosophy of vedanta and the vedas so ninth session starting off with nine examples of uddalaka to me feels very auspicious and it also reminds me that we are all in the right direction contemplating on the philosophy of sanatana dharma okay so before um you know getting into the nitty gritties of it and of course i don't want to spend going back discussing all the previous background to to this particular session you are all now resident experts on um how the discussion starts off with this arrogance and shweta ketu and the dad poses him an an important question the fellow is not able to answer then he starts off with his philosophy essentially talking about the greatness of the supreme and how we are dependent on the supreme how we may have some amount of resemblance to the supreme so those were all the key concepts then he started talking about the supremacy of the supreme by talking about creation and then he goes on to talk about how in the in the daily activities of of us jeevas in the samsara both in the waking cycle sleep cycle dreamless state how we go through a few things that that illustrate that nothing is uh, that we own in this world and everything belongs to the supreme and then how he brings in the concept of tejas ap and annam the three uh, you know uh, three exalted sentient beings who are responsible for all of the creations that we see in our, in in this world under the guidance of the supreme being so we have seen that so in that context uh, to talk about the utter dependence of uh, the jeevas uddalaka then starts this 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 very famous uh, illustrations he takes nine examples okay so i just want us all to think about how it used to be in the vedic times so in the vedic times they were not sitting in skyscrapers and and in, in concrete jungles like how we live these days people used to live in the forest rishis used to live in in very natural surroundings and they were seeing everything around them so the rivers the, the mountains the trees the birds the flowers and and they were seeing all this every day in the in our lives for us we may have to make a trip once in a week to go to a national trust to see all this so they were living in the middle of all the beauty of nature and the philosophy that they used to derive the philosophy that they used to understand were all inspired by what they were seeing in the natural world so these nine examples that uddalaka takes they all come from the forest if you have a, if you actually think about each example it's quite interesting he is actually picking things from the forest and explaining to his son some deep philosophies so he takes nine examples from the forest to to illustrate the fundamental philosophy of the vedas yeah so these are the nine steps to philosophical enlightenment if we have to know few things in this world having born as a human being if you want to know few things these nine illustrations and what they tell us if we know this fully and completely then our existence as human being is is fulfilled i would say and veda vyasa very very nicely puts it आवृत्ति असकृत उपदेशा 
So what does that mean? He says, you know, read, 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 and read again. Think, think, think again, contemplate again and again in your life. You know, just because you've read once doesn't mean you've actually assimilated and understood the whole thing. Go back and read and revise and contemplate is what Vyasa is telling us. The, the founding father of Vedanta Darshana is asking us to revise again and again. And I think my humble request to all of us here is these nine steps of philosophical enlightenment that Uddalaka is giving to Shweta Ketu. Believe me, you cannot understand the full, you cannot grasp the, 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 the depth of the philosophy that is being described just with you know, reading it once or listening to it once. My humble request is over the next several years, we should all be doing this as regularly as we can. Go back to what Uddalaka explained. How does it fit into that philosophy? How does how do we apply that in our daily lives? Yeah. So that is the inspiration that Uddalaka is giving us through Shweta Ketu. So nine steps to philosophical enlightenment. So I want to pause here for a minute and just get us thinking here. Why did Uddalaka give nine examples? You know, he could have given six examples. He could have given 12 examples but he chose to give nine examples. Why? So before we go to the next slide, just want to sort of kindle the discussions within the audience to say why. So we got some chat coming through. So Pragnesh very nicely says Navada Bhakti. Very good, Pragnesh. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Why that nine is important? Okay, so we move on. If there are no uh, immediate contributions there, let's move on. Navaratri, you have. Navaratri, okay, thank you, Pratibhaji. That's also very interesting. So it's coming up, isn't it? Next week, Navaratri is starting. Again, that's again, it's auspicious. We are doing those nine examples in Navaratri. So that also seems quite interesting. So let's think about this a bit more detail as to why nine examples. You know, that, that certainly got me thinking this morning as to why nine examples. And I've summarized this with, with various informations that I've gathered. Uh, both from the gurus from whom I have learned and from various uh, texts. So what I have done today is I've invited a few of our friends to actually take us through the significance of nine. Why did Uddalaka take nine examples? What is the significance of nine in Sanatana Dharma? And as you know, in Vedic philosophy, Sankhya is very important, a lot of numbers. In numerology, there is lots of philosophies that is often discussed in, in Vedas and Vedanta. So significance of nine is again, it's not a coincidence that Uddalaka has taken nine. Why? So I'm going to start off with Nitaji, who's going to take up this verse from chapter five, verse 13. And, and, and recite, uh, recite it for us, Nita Ji. Sarva karmani manasa sanyasya sthe sukham vashi navad pare pure dehi naiva kurvan nakarayan Thank you, Nitaji. So this body that we have, Krishna says in chapter 5, this body has nine openings. Yeah, and we as humans, they, we interact with the external world. This sharira that we have is what we call a sadhana shariras. We are very lucky to have had a human form of life rather than a dog or a cat. Yeah, and I see quite a lot of cats in my backyard or the fellows are you know, taking their dogs for walks on a daily basis a number of times on the roads. We have not been born as cats or dogs. We are born as humans. We've got this sadhana sharira Sadhana Sharira to understand the deeper philosophies of life. Yeah, Animals also, they eat, they sleep, they mate, and they defend, they do all sorts of stuff, but they don't have higher intellect. Their buddhi is not evolved. But for us, thankfully, our buddhi is evolved. So we are able to ask deeper questions. So Krishna is giving that nine, nine dware pure dehi. I'm going to go to Veenaji next. Who is going to pick up a verse from Bhagavatam to tell us why that nine is important? Veenaji. Sri Pralhada Uvacha Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnoho Smaranam Pada Sevanam Archanam Vandanam Dasyam Sakyam Atmani Vedanam Itipum Sarpita Vishno Bhaktishchanava Lakshana Kriyeta Bhagavat Tanmani Dhita Muttamam. 
Thank you so much, Vinaji. So that nine different forms of bhakti. So you are this body, you have this sadhana sharira with nine openings and you have, you're interacting with the external world, but you need to understand higher philosophies. And when you understand the higher purpose and why this world is here and so on, then you understand that there is the supreme being. And that supreme being then means that you worship that supreme being. Right. And what are the nine forms of bhakti, nine forms of worship that is described in the Bhagavatam, Shravanam, hearing the names and the glories of the Lord, Kirtanam, chanting his glory, Smaranam, remembering the Lord, Padasevanam, serving the Lord's feet, Archanam, worshipping the Lord, Vandanam, offering obeisance unto the Lord, Dasyam, serving the Lord as his servant, Sakyam, developing a friendship with the Lord, Atma Nivedanam, total surrender of oneself. To the Lord. So these are the nine forms of worship described in Bhagavatam. Again, the number nine. Now, whilst we are talking about nine, we've had a few chats that have come through as well. So Harish Ji has said Navadwara. Very good, Harish. Kavita has said Navadwara again. Shreyas has said Navagraha. So we are all thinking along the right direction. Thank you so much. Keep it coming. So that is the nine forms of worship. Now, we have done chapter 15 of Bhagavad Gita and we have looked at this in great detail. And the last five verses we know is the quintessence of Vedic philosophy. So I've asked Padmaja ji to recite the, the five verses for us. Padmaja. Vavema Purusha Loke Kshara Sarvani Bhutani Kutastokshara Uchyate Uttama Purusha Svanyaha Paramatme Dhyuta Hrutaha Yoloka Trayama Vishya Vivatya Vyaya Ishwaraha Yasma Taksharamati Toham Akshara Tapichotamaha Atos Viloke Vedesha Pratita Purushotamaha Yoma Meva Masam Mudo Janati Purushotamam Sa Sarva Ved Bajatimam Sarva Bhavena Bharata Iti Gukyatamam Shastram Idam Ukta Mayanakaha Yetat Budva Buddhimanasya Krita Kritasya Bharata. Thank you very much, Padmaja. Uh, so well recited. So these are the five quint verses or quintessence of Vedic philosophy. And when we were doing the chapter 15, we then came across this Prameya Navamalika. And I'm going to come to that next. But before we go there, we had a few friends talking about other nines in Hindu philosophy, Navagrahas. These Navagrahas in the Hindu system influence all the things that we do in, the li in our lives. Navaratri coming up from the 7th of October. Navadhanya and Navaratna. Navadhanya, Navaratna is very important. They are used, for example, if you're building a temple or you're doing any auspicious establishment, you put Navadhanya, Navaratna and you build on this. So Navadhanya, Navaratna is also very auspicious in the, in the Hindu system. Now, talking about Navaratna, it becomes very important because if you remember when we did chapter 15, we spoke about the Prameya Navamalika, the nine gems of Vedic philosophy. All that Krishna has said in chapter 15 is summarized by Vyasa Tirta in this Prameya Navamalika. Suresh ji, do you want to give us a, 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 a Prameya Navamalika as per Vyasa Tirta, please? Sriman Madhvamate Hari Parataraha Satyam Jagat Tattvato Bhedo Jeeva Gana Hare Ranuchara Hani Chocha Bhavangataha Muktir Naija Sukhanu Bhuti Ramala Bhaktishya Tat Sadhanam Yakshaditritayam Pramanam Makilam Nayaika Vedyo Hari. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Suresh. So, those Prameya Navamalika, the nine tenets of Vedantic philosophy summarized in this verse, inspired by the last five verses of chapter 15 of Bhagavad Gita. So, I would urge all of us to go back to that session where we discussed this at great depth and Suresh ji actually did a workshop on that, discussing again, dissecting it in great detail for all of us. So the nine tenets of Vedic philosophy. So the core philosophy is also nine. If we can understand these nine philosophies, then it is we have, we have accomplished things in our lives. Yeah. Look at Vedic mathematics. I just want to introduce this concept of Vedic mathematics, ancient Vedic mathematics. Look, take the circle. You know, if you take the it's 360 degrees. 
you divide it into two, it's 180 degrees. You divide that into two, it's 90 degrees. You divide that into 40, uh, another two, 45 degrees. You add these numbers, three plus six, one plus eight, nine plus zero, four plus five, what do you get? Nine. Take the magic number nine in Vedic mathematics. Any number you add to nine, that number will remain. So for example, nine plus one is 10. One plus zero is one. Nine plus two is 11. One plus one is two. Nine plus three is 12. One plus two is three. So uh, that's the beauty of the number. Take nine in multiplication. Nine, plus, nine times one is nine. Nine times two is 18. One plus eight is nine. Nine times three is 27. Two plus seven is nine. So the Vedic mathematicians were able to recognize that number nine is a magic number. So when you add, whatever you add remains. When you multiply with any number, you add it, it is still nine. Look at the number 18. Yeah, we have done a lot of things about number 18. Yeah, one plus eight is nine. That's not a coincidence. 18th Tattva is Vishnu. One plus eight equals nine. We have done this in our Gita sessions. Jaya, Mahabharata is called Jaya because it stands for 18. You take Jakara and Yakara. It is eight and one, 18. How many Parvas in Mahabharata? 18. How many chapter in Gita? 18. How many Akshohinis? 18. How many battle? How many days of battle? 18. How many in, in Gita chapter 15? 18 verses are the key verses. The last two verses are Phala verses. Isha Upanishad has got 18 mantras, which is one of the most important mantras celebrating the Supreme. 1 plus 8 equals 9. So when you look at Sanatana Dharma, that number 9 is all pervasive. And next time when you see number 9, think about these things that our rishis have been thinking about as to how important 9 is. And it is no surprise that Uddalaka has actually decided to give us 9 examples to illustrate the 9 fundamental philosophies of Sanatana Dharma. I hope you find that interesting. But I think that is the beauty of Shastras with lots of hidden meanings in every aspect of what the rishis tell us. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. So just wanted to briefly recap this illustration, the first illustration that we had a brief discussion last week. So a couple of weeks ago. So let me just go through this verse. Sayata shakuni sutrena prabaddo disham disham patitva anyatra ayatanam alabdva bandhanameva upashrayate evameva kalu somyatan mano disham disham patitva anyatra ayatanam alabdva pranameva upashrayate prana bandhanam hi eva mana iti. So what did he say in this? There is this bird right through the thread to a pillar. The bird is completely dependent on this pillar to which it is tied. Yeah. So this concept, this illustration here gives you a beautiful example how the bird, the movement of the bird is entirely dependent on how it is tied to the pillar. The length of the rope will still dictate how much it is able to fly around. And as you know, in the uh, at night time, it comes down and then sleeps next to this pillar, this post. So we have discussed that in great detail. So in this example, the bird is the jiva. This pillar or the post is Brahman. Yeah. So this example that gives you an illustration of dependence immediately should remind you of this Bimba and Pratibimba relationship between the Jiva and Brahman or the Supreme. So in this example, Jiva is the Pratibimba and Bimba is this, this, this pillar and this is the object. So the question that I have for us to think about is the relationship between object and the image. Are they the same? Are they similar or are they different? So what do we think is that relationship between Bimba, which is the object, and the Pratibimba. So can I have some contributions here, please? They are similar. They are similar, Suresh. Thank you. Anybody else got a different view? Different. No different. Pradesh, go on. It depends on the other factors like lighting, angle, etc. But dependent, I would say. They could be dependent on each other. Dependent on each other. Okay, so in that case, okay, explain how the image is dependent on the object. So, for example, my image in a mirror, depending on what sort of mirror it is, is it biconvex, biconcave? You know, this all in a, in a children 
play area, zoo, etc. Usually you have various uh, uh, areas where you can see tall, short, fat. Uh, so that's what I meant. Okay, thank you, Pragnesh. Uh, excellent. So Shushrut has also said similar but dependent is the is the image. Okay, so we are getting a theme here. So the object here is this post, which is Brahman. The image is this bird, which is the jiva. So this bimba pratibimba bhava, very first described in the Rig Veda, rupam rupam pratirupo babuvaha tadasya rupam pratichakshanaya. That is a fundamental verse of Rig Veda that describes the relationship between Brahman and the Jiva through Bimba Pratibimba relationship. So if the object is not there, the image is not there. If the object does not make an attempt to wear the tie, the image does not wear the tie. But the image is not the same as the object. Yeah? It is totally dependent on the object. The image is totally dependent on the object. But there is an element of sadrishya. There is an element of similarity. Whereas the object is Pradhanya. So again, you know, with the Dudalaka's concept of Sadrishya and Pradhanya also comes in this Bimba Pratibimba Bhava. So we need to think about this, about this bird and the post is essentially talking about that relationship of dependence. This has got nothing to do whether if the mirror is gone, is the jiva going to go away and all that exists is only the object. So that is a, that is a fallacious argument. Uh, here, the concept that the Rig Veda is talking about is the concept of dependence of the reflection on the object. Okay, And who is this pillar? Who is this Brahman? Uddalaka has celebrated this in so many ways. Initially, it's Sadeva Somya Idamekra Asi the Ekameva Advityam. This Brahman, the Sat, is one and he was there before creation and he has celebrated that, this, this Pradhanya Vastu or the Bimba. And he has also said previously, San Mulaha, Somya Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sada, Ayatanaha, Sat Pratishtaha. And he has celebrated this Sat as that everything else gets its origin from it. Everything else is dependent on it. For everything, it is the Ashraya. And for everything, it is the final destination, is what he has said in this very famous verse that Uddalaka has said, San Mulaha, Somya Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sada, Ayatanaha, Sat Pratishtaha. So now what Uddalaka is, is going to do is he's going to talk to us about Brahman. So this post is there, right? How is that Sat? What is that Brahman? What is that Bimba? We have spoken so much about this, this chap now, but how is this Brahman? Okay. To describe how is that Brahman, he immediately takes us to the next verse, which somehow is a controversial verse for some people, but for others, it is a beautiful verse that celebrates the greatness of the Supreme. What did Uddalaka say here? Saya esho anima aitadatmyam vidam sarvam tat satyam saatma tatvamasi shvetaketo. So this is the famous verse. And last time when we looked at this, we said uh, the various concepts, this is talking about a non-material entity. We, we spoke about rules of interpretation, if you remember. So this verse is talking about Brahman. Yeah? It is a non-material entity. So this particular verse becomes authoritative with regards to what it says. So the next step there is whether it is a Niravakasha Shruti or a Savakasha Shruti. It is a Savakasha Shruti. Savakasha Shruti means there are different ways of approaching and understanding this verse. There isn't just one way of looking at it and say that is the final answer. There are so many ways of looking at this verse. So Savakasha Shruti. So in the rules of interpretation of Vedic verses, Niravakasha Shruti takes prominence over Savakasha Shruti. But when there is a Savakasha Shruti, you need to have rules of interpretation called as Tatparya Lingas to understand what the verse is saying. So we are not going to go into every aspect of the Tatvarya Lingas, but over the next three or four sessions, we will look at how these verses open up in different ways for our contemplation. Yeah, so let's look at this. So there are 12 words before Tatvamasi, and we spent very briefly last time, Saha, Yaha, Eshaha, Anima, Etar, Atmiyam, Idam, Sarvam, Tat, Satyam, Saha, Atma. So these 12 adjectives are given to the Supreme Being. And then it says Tatvamasi. Okay, so we need to understand the context as Vyasa advises us again and again, Prakaranath. Take the context and understand 
what uddalaka is saying about that sat that pillar pillar to which this bird is attached let's not forget that this is the context here he is talking about that bird and a pillar and now he is describing how that post or a pillar pillar is and he is giving these adjectives so what are these adjectives saha we said saha means etymologically so we should look at etymologically saha means in colloquial sanskrit that which is some something that's very far saha means somebody who is very far away is called saha yeah so but in vedic sanskrit it is more etymological so saratvat saha that means saratvat saha means raso vai saha and we have done this before these verses are nice worth going through again rasahi eva ayam labdva anandi bhavati so rasa means he who is full of ananda yeah yaha means yamayati or yamyati that means he is full of jnana swarupa and he who controls every aspect of the universe for that bird he is controlling that bird by holding it yeah let us not forget that in that 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 that, that illustration there yeshah a ishah or ishtah he is the dearest friend of this this bird that bird what happens to that bird night time when it is tired it comes and sleeps next to him similarly the jeevas in the state of shushupti after going around everywhere during the day time they come to they come close to him and sleep next to him that is the shushupti state so ishaha a ishtaha yeah and we know the dwa suparana verse very well so if saha is there eshaha means this fellow who is very close to who so a ishtaha this person he is very very close to you he is not only very far away but he is also very close to you and we saw that narayana shukta yajurveda antar bahishta tat sarvam vyapya narayana stitah never forget that verse because that is a foundational verse for all that vedas have to say he is everywhere but how is he he is anima anima means very subtle and of course the etymology of anima can be at least three types anutvena meya anayati ma anu and ma so last week we discussed a lot about about anutvena meya anayati ma that means anutvena meya means he is very very subtle this subtle being who is everywhere in the universe and is also inside us is so subtle but we need to know that subtle yeah to know that subtle what do we need anayati plus ma which means we need his grace his unless his grace is there we can't see him and the next level of the anuma meaning is anu plus ma anu means jeeva and the jeeva has to see him and know him with our external senses we are never going to be able to see the supreme because these are all material a material eye is never going to be see able to see something that is non material so it is only a non material thing that can actually see a non material thing so that concept of anu ma anu is jeeva ma means jnana so it's only the jeeva that can actually see the antaryamin who is inside him so the anima that is why he is called anima so these are all the names of the supreme that celebrates certain aspects and his greatness saya esha anima what happens next etad atmyam idam sarvam this etad etad is very close to you atmyam idam sarvam atmyam is he is the swami he controls idam sarvam all else in the universe both the sharas the met, the jada the sharas akshara purushottama or you can say aksharaha kutastho aksharaha and aksharaha from the 15th verse we can understand that this person is supreme most but he is the swami or the master or the governor of all these idam sarvam okay so aitad atmyam idam sarvam yeah that's what uddalaka says and then he immediately says tat satyam tat is his name he is also called tat because tataha means all pervasive and we know this verse from chapter gita chapter 17 could i invite one of our friends to recite this please 1723 who wants to take this any volunteers shall i read madhu shila ji go on yeah तत्सदिति निर्देशो स्मृतः ब्राह्मणास्तेन वेदाश्च ब्राह्मणस्तेन वेदाश्चता 
Thank, Thank you very much, Shilaji. Very beautifully said. So, and uh, Krishna says, "Tat is my name. I my I am also called Om. I am also called Tat. I am also called Sat. Yeah. So Om Tat Sat. These are all my main my names. Arjuna is what Krishna has said in that verse. And we have done in Gayatri also. So Tataha is his name. Yeah. Satyam. We know Satyam is his name because as you know in Taitre Upanishad, Brahma Vidapnoti Param Tadesha Abhyukta Satyam." Jnanam, anantam, Brahma. Yeah, it gives a it gives a definition of who the Brahma is, and very first it uses this Satyam, and of course Satyam itself opens up into various ways, and we have done these sessions before of actually splitting Satyam into Sat, Ti, and Ya, and Yam, and so on and so forth. So you can go back to those previous lectures, but essentially saying he is number one Nirdushta. He is without any defects. And he is Nyana Nanda Swarupa. So those are the two basic definitions of the Supreme, and of course is involved in eightfold dispensation of the world of Jadas and sentient beings, creation, existence, destruction, maintenance, giving knowledge, giving ignorance, giving bandha, and also giving moksha. So those eight components of the cosmic dispensation of the supreme is again covered by satyam so again he is celebrated as satyam yeah so remember this this pillar or brahman is being given all these adjectives by uddalaka to shweta ketu and then he says look etad atmyam idam sarvam this whole thing is dependent on him and that is why it is real tat satyam therefore the created world is real it is not an illusion and we saw these verses from shvetashvata upanishad and shrimad bhagavatam last time so again go back and and have a revision of those yeah so we are so uddalaka is reminding us of the great qualities of the supram supreme who is controlling this bird or the jiva okay then he said saha atma tatvamasi so he said saha so there that saha is not the same meaning as sarabat saratvat saha or saha is that person who is out there when the vedas give you similar same words in the same sentence each word has got a different meaning they don't have the same meaning so first when he says saya esha anima that sa there was saratvat saha but here saha means sadayati iti saha sadayati means whatever we ask he would give yeah so that is why he is called saha and it would say he is also called atma and i'll discuss that in the next verse as to what that atma is because we need to understand who this atma is before we understand why this tatvamasi has come there so again sa atma tatvamasi and we did this basic grammar yeah this is this is not some phd work this is basic year 1 grammar of swarna dirga sandhihi Yeah, when there is a long vowel and a short vowel next to each other, they merge with each other. It becomes one long vowel. So, atma a is the dirga, and hraswa is a. So, when they join, it becomes a. Okay. So, when you have sa atma tatvamasi, it can become atma atatvamasi or atma tatvamasi. Okay. So, like we've dealt dealt with this before. So, note this very important point here. rishis are very clever the, the vedic rishis because let's not forget chandogya upanishad is apaurishya it is an intuition of the rishis and he has just received it and he is just telling it yeah so he has just only said tatvamasi to make things easy for our monistic friends he could have said sat tvamasi sa atma sat tvamasi problem solved there is no controversy at all if the verse was sat tvam asi but it is not satvam asi it is tat tvam asi now for the dualistic schools he could have said tvam atat asi if he had said that the dualistic school would have raised their arms and said we are right and he could have just said tvam atat asi and if he had said that problem solved for the dualistic schools but the rishi here has not said that yeah so that is the beauty of our vedas and our our our, uh, our shastras because they keep it very cryptic because that is why they are called chandas yeah we have done this before chandas means vedas what is chandas means chadayanti hava enam chandamsi 
you have to break it open you have to have individual effort this is important you do your individual efforts you do your research you do your thinking you do your contemplation and reason out mate vedas are not going to write it down everything and give it to you on the table so that you can just eat it and go away no it is not for the man on the streets it is for deep contemplation and thinking and the rishis and this is a recurrent theme in the in the upanishads that these are all these informations that are kept in a very cryptic way so that they can open up in various different directions it is up to individual efforts to understand what the rishi is actually saying or where the what the apaurushaya veda is actually saying so it is that individual effort that is required to understand because he could have said satvamasi or he could have said tvam atatasi that is not what was said it, what was said was atma tatvamasi so tat was put there not sat so let's come back to that i hope you will find this interesting why is that important so what do we have sa atma tatvamasi shvetaketo so saha here we have said sadayati iti saha that saha is also a name of the supreme sadayati that which gives whatever we ask for is saha then immediately after saha uddalaka puts atma who is this atma yeah is the atma you and me or atma somebody else i just want to open it up for discussions so whom do we think is the real atma here so who is going to take this on or uh, in a more contributions the better who is atma or what are the meanings of atma suresh ಅರ್ಥ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಪರಮಾತ್ಮ but it can be used colloquially to mean a few other things as well yeah thank you suresh wonderful so all of us got it wrong right sorry we all got it absolutely right so the atma has got several meanings so atma can mean the body somebody said atma hatya that means they give up their body yes so atma is called the body atma can mean the mind as jagadish but mentioned atma can mean the buddhi atma can mean the jiva atma can also mean the paramatma but the as suresh was pointing out the parama mukhya vritti as it's called or the most important meaning of atma is paramatma there are all these other meanings of atma but it has to be taken in context yeah here the context is uddalaka is talking about the supreme saya esh anima aitadatmya midam sarvam tat satyam saha atma so in that context the atma is the supreme being not the jiva yeah like how our yagna velkar yagna valkya reminded maitreyi atma va are drashtavya shrotavyo mantavyo nitidyasitavyo maitreyi so he said maitreyi you should see that atma there the atma means not the jivatma or the body it means the supreme brahman yeah and in brahma sutra veda vyasa in the very first adhyaya actually takes on this problem is atma jiva or brahman when it when it is discussed in the shastras when the word atma comes is it pratyagatman which is the jivatman or paramatman which is brahman what is the de- definition of atman when it comes in the shastra and veda vyasa gives us a definition who is our founding fathers let's not forget him gaunas chetna atma shabda that is the sutra there that means gaunas chetna means gaunas chet means the three gunas yeah atma jivas are bound by three gunas yeah in our in our existence that is not what the atma means in the shastras so gaunas chet na no atma shabda so there the atma shabda means primarily the supreme being okay and of course we have seen in mandukya upanishad if you remember uh, sarvam hi etat brahma ayam atma brahma so when varuna celebrates this antaryami he says this fellow who is very close to me this brahman who is everywhere he is also close to me and he is called atma okay so there are other schools which look at it differently and would say atma cha brahma this jivatman himself is paramatman that is the monistic view but if you look at the varuna what he is saying here 
he says you know that brahman who is the everywhere the same brahman is the one who is inside you and he is also called atma how do you resolve this gaunas chetna atma shabda and also take internal evidence from other upanishads and then when you take atma as a word that are so the etymology of atma is so important apnoti iti atma apnoti means that which is inside you is atma adatte iti atma that which gives you everything is atma exactly like sadayati adatte iti atma atti iti atma he who eats everything during dissolution is atma atatatvat iti atma atatat means that which is all pervading is the is is, is also called atma okay and of course atma also means our inner controller or our swami and that we have read this before so here atma primarily denotes god only and nobody else so there cannot be any controversy here so saha atma so he has said so much uddalaka has said saya esha anima aitadatmyam idam sarvam tat satyam saha atma and then he puts this puzzling words tatvam asi now how we should read this is as i told you in the previous verse we should use grammar grammar or any grammar to to open it up and understand how do you read it so we have said it can be sa atma tatvam asi or sa atma atatvam asi so the easiest way of looking at it with no controversy but using basic grammar is if you look at sa atma atatvam asi it is very easy because in the last 12 words udalaka has said this fellow is so great saya esha anima aitadatmam idam sarvam tat satyam satyam you are kidding me shweta ketu any of those are you any of those you are none of shed your ego shweta ketu because you are not him you do not have any of those qualities you did not create the universe you do not control anything why are you standing in front of me like a pillar so when the father tells him off that is like a shock treatment for shweta ketu when he has described all this supreme person with all these adjectives so that is one way of looking at it but then but it is still there saha atma tatvamasi there is no problem you can still look at it as atma tatvamasi so there the tat so in the vedic times tat used to be a very very popular and an important word the reason being people used to use tat in seven different meanings that's called sapta su prathama so if, uh, for those interested in sanskrit please google sapta su prathama and read about it and compare it to english english grammar it's very similar various cases for nouns sapta su prathama so the tat there can have seven meanings tat adina tat sadrishya tasmin tasma tasmai tasya tat prati okay so those are all the ways so you this example so we have to always pull ourselves back to what is the example that is being described the example that is being described is the bird and the post or the jiva and the prabhan so here what you can say is after he has said celebrated the supreme saya esha anima itadatmam idam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tat adina tvam asi tat sadrishya tvam asi so when you look take the sapta su prathama meaning there it fits very well so tat adinatvam asi so this bird is tied through this sutra to this pillar that is what uddalaka has given the example so in that context what you should understand is you are not him but you, you are dependent on him yeah you are not him but you have some similarity some similar features like him is what uddalaka is saying there sa atma tat adinatvam asi tat sadrishya tamasi shweta ketu okay so now this is important because when you want and the meaning when you want to understand the philosophy you have to go back to the illustration that is being given there yeah so the illustration there is what there is a bird which is tied to a rope to a pillar so in this example the bird is different the rope is different and the pillar is different every component of this illustration is different and also what does this uh, shakuni does this bird bandhanam eva upa ashrayate it comes and only rests 
next to the pillar it does not become the pillar so those illustration the words are very clear and the philosophy is there and uddalaka has given the example to illustrate a philosophy what is that philosophy tat adina tvamasi tat sadrushya tvamasi so when you look at it from that angle in the context putting in the rules of grammar there is no controversy from where i see it, and the and the illustration flows smoothly with regards to the philosophy that we want to learn yeah so moving on so this tattvamasi is, is a is is it's plagued the brains of so many people over hundreds and hundreds of years so let's look at it a bit more in detail because that word tattvamasi itself opens up giving us various answers i told you about sapta suprathama i told you about the seven ways in which that tat can be opened up but the word tattvamasi itself opens up in so many other ways when you think and contemplate about this and my request here is let's go back to these sessions and think about it again and again and read other books to grasp what uddalaka is telling us so what is he telling us tat tvam asi three words yeah tat tat means what tataha tata we know that which is all pervasive antar bahishta tat sarvam vyapya narayana sthitaha correct so he said tat you know that tat who is there everywhere the same tat tvam asi that same tat is inside you that is another way of looking at that word tattvamasi the same tat who is outside he is also inside you exactly what narayana shukta has said yeah who is inside you your antaryamin so the verse if you look at it in that direction it is talking about antaryamin this same tataha is also tvam asi inside you as your antaryamin Okay, and we have this verse in chapter fifteen, isn't it? Fifteenth verse. So Gita also talks about it. Sarvasya cha aham rudi sannivishta ha. I am inside everybody's heart. Antaryamin. And again, Veda Vyasa comes to our rescue here. There are two sutras. He has given the rules for inter interpretation. Antaryami yadi deva dishad dharma vyapadeshad. शास्त्र दृष्टियातुपदेशो वामदेववत आई कम टू दिस इन द नेक्स्ट वर्ड्स दिस सूत्र इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट शास्त्र दृष्टियातु उपदेशः वामदेववत ओके व्हाट इज दैट शास्त्र दृष्टि ऑफ व्हाट वामदेव एक्सपीरियंस्ड ही एक्सपीरियंस्ड द अंतर्यामित्व ऑफ द सुप्रीम सो व्हेन यू लुक एट द ततः त्वमसि द फेलो हु इज एवरीवेयर इज इनसाइड यू no problem from that angle how tattvamasi opens up so what again my my hope here is we should not go with a preconceived idea of what tattvamasi is with our ideas we should look at the verse and see how it opens up that's what is called chadayanti iti chandamsi okay so now you look at it from a, another angle that is another interesting angle some uh, th these are names of the supreme tataha we know is the name of the supreme because he krishna has said om tat sat iti nirdesha tvam and some of you may not be familiar with this etymology of the word tam tvam tvam comes with two root words tavas or twish tavas is bala or strength twish means shining prakashamana tejo roopah jnanaanandamaya jnanamaya all those things is twish tavas is bala sarvakarta ya yeah, bala ya yeah. so that is the meaning of tvam ya yeah. asi is a name of the supreme asu asi comes from the root word asu prerane which means sarva preraka he who is the controller of everything so when you look at the verse tattvam asi these are all the names of the supreme in another angle tataha tavas twish asu prerane okay look at the beauty of uh, what uddalaka has taken uddalaka has taken an example of a post or a pillar to which this bird is attached to and he said this pillar is brahman and we all know that famous story of Na hiranyakashipu and prahlada and where did narasimha came out from he comes out from a pillar or a post and narasimha comes out for that and uh, you know when you do this comparative analysis the samanvaya of the shastra is completely there there is no controversy at all here so this balatma and prahlada what does he worship as for those of you who are familiar with shrimad bhagavatam and this particular incident 
he worships this narasimha has you are bala you are full of strength and so on and so forth he worships him as yeah so tum tavas bala khalada think about narasimha think about the post think about the post that the uddalaka has actually described yeah so they all link up to the same concept yeah so when you look at that from that angle tatvamasi then becomes the name of the supreme asi becomes name of the supreme and that is the same as in aham brahmasmi and we have dealt with this before maybe on another occasion we can take this because that is what vedavyasa has said in the previous slide shastra drushtya atupadesho vamadevavat why did he say that because in brahadarine kopanishad we all know this famous verse again like tatvamasi brahma va idam agra asi tadatmanam eva avet aham brahmasmi iti tasmat tat sarvam abavat tad yo yo devanam pratyabudyata sa eva tadabavat tata rishinam tata manushyanam tade tat pashyan rishihi vamadevah pratipede aham manuhu abavam suryashcha iti okay so all these things are linked because where the vamadeva is celebrating the supreme as the antaryamin of manu antaryamin of surya okay so again there aham and brahma and asmi or the names of the supreme it does not mean i am brahman or for example tatvamasi does not mean i am brahman in the in the other other side of the coin they are all the names of the supreme when we look at these angles it opens up entirely differently so my intention is to give you a different perspective of how to look at the vedas okay so moving on to the next slide so again we are still stuck with tatvamasi because there is so much to be said about tatvamasi and sometimes sometimes i feel this is most unfortunate when i hear some speakers talk about tatvamasi as thou art that and then get on with other things in life no tatvamasi has got so many other ways of contemplation if we do not do that we are forgetting what our rishis are actually telling us so look at this aitad atmam idam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tatvamasi so aitad atmam idam sarvam is this jagat or the prakriti so that jagat becomes the tat there tvam is the jiva there asi so what he says is you jivas who are there in the samsara right you are all part of this material existence at this point of time you are all part of this aitad atmam idam sarvam that tat is there right you are tvam asi why because idam is in napumsaka linga atma is in pullinga so we let's not spend too much time up with this so you have to look at the gram each word whether it is feminine masculine neutral and then link with other words when you do that this is another way in which you look at it that this jivas are all part of this material existence which has also got jadas but then you are not the jada you are similar to me because you are sentient so tat sadrishya tvam asi okay but you know me i am entirely different from all these i am totally different from all these this is what our gita chapter 15 out of sto akshara akshara and the purusha shukta that we have done before that is what the purusha shukta has also spoken about yeah uh, i don't know if anybody is interested in the, in, uh, in uh, reciting the purusha shukta harish do you want to have a go at this okay uh, sure um, yeah. yeah i'm here yeah go for the purusha shukta i'm trying to find the verse uh, which where does it start i am not able to see i'm the... here in the slide here om sahasra shirisha the first varga okay okay om sahasra shirisha purushah sahasraksha sahasrapat sa bhumim vishvato vrutva atyatishta dashangulam what that's why harish thank you so purush eva idam sarvam yadbhutam yachcha bhavyam uta amrutatvasy ishanah yad annena atirohati etavanasya mahima ato jayamscha purushah pado asya vishvabhutani tripadasya amrutan divi tripad urdva udait purushah tripad urdva udait purushah pado asya ih abhavat punah so when you look at these verse in purusha shukta it's very clearly said he is far beyond 
the prakriti and the jivas is far above them but you jiva tvam asi from what tat so you are all part of this material existence so that is another view when you look at tatvam asi not just thou art that okay now so i hope i've just given you a sample here we can keep talking about what this tatvam asi actually means with with so, with so much more examples but when Uddalaka has said, Sayata, Shakuni, Shutrena, Prabaddo, Disham, Disham, Patitva, Anyatra, Ayatana, Malabdva, Bandana, Meva, Upashrayate, Eva, Meva, Kalasomyatan, Mano, Disham, Disham, Patitva, Anyatra, Ayatana, Malabdva, Prana, Meva, Upashrayate, Prana, Bandana, Mhi, Somya, Mana, Iti. So, when our Uddalaka told Shvetaketu this, Shvetaketu, as you know, he is a, he is a clever university student. He has just come back from the university. So Shweta Ketu then immediately, he is still not satisfied with the example. He says, if this, this, this bird comes and sits or rests very next to the pillar, I don't understand how the bird is not able to recognize the pillar. If the supreme being, you're saying Sayayesha, Anima, etc. And if the supreme being is everywhere and he is very subtle, but he is everywhere and he is inside me also, why can't I see him or know him? What you're saying is very fictitious. If he is really very close to me, if he is really very next to me, why am I I'm not able to see him? This is a popular question that everybody asks, right? If the God is everywhere, why am I not able to see him? If he is so close to me, when I'm in Sushupti, why am I not able to see him or know him? This is the question that comes to Uddalaka when the first exam is completed. So again, what we should remember here is when you do this nine steps of contemplation of philosophical truths, each example leads on to the next example. They are not to be taken in isolation. It is not one example and then the next example. No. The first example, Shweta Ketu understands something. We are all Shweta Ketus here. We should take Take that rock, get into Shvetaketu's shoes here, and then feel how he is asking this question. So when Uddalaka has replied that you are very close to him in Sushupti, Shvetaketu immediately asks, if I am very close to him, why am I not able to see him or know him? Bhūya eva ma Bhagavan vijñāpayatvaiti. Tell me more, my dear father. Tell me more. So Uddalaka says, tata somya iti ho vacha. So be it, my son. I will explain it to you further. So what I'll do is the next 15 minutes, I thought I'll do three examples, uh, but I think we are not going to be able to do three examples. We'll take up the next example and talk about what the next example is. And then the following week, we'll take example number three. Because here, Shweta Ketu is asking, why am I not able to see the Supreme who is very close to me? And immediately, our friend Uddalaka, where is he? He's in the forest. And what is there in the forest? There are all the trees. He is in a beautiful ashrama, right? He's in a beautiful ashrama, a hermitage. He's, he's living peacefully in the forest. There are trees all around him. And he is he is talking to his son Shvetaketu, and he's and he's now showing this uh, this uh, this bee, this um, uh, this honeycomb that is there, beehive, that beehive that is there in one of the trees that he's he can see, and he's showing to Uddalaka, look, see that beehive. Let me give you an example from the beehive. And he says, Yata Somya Madhu Madhukrito Nistishtanti Nanat Yayanam Rukshanam Rasanam Samavaharam Yekatam Rasam Gamayanti Te Yata Tatra Navivekam Labante Amushyaham Rikshasya Raso Asmi Amushyaham Rikshasya Raso Asmi Iti Eva meva kalu somya imaha sarvaha prajaha sati sampadya naviduhu sati sampadya maha iti. Beautiful verse and an amazing illustration immediately showing the beehive. Look there at the beehive and see what is going on. From that, you can understand why, although you are very close to the Supreme in Sushupti, not just in Sushupti, in every state of consciousness of your life, you are very close to the Supreme, but still you don't understand he is there very next to you. Why? This is the same state as this. So let's look at this word. Yata so, somya madhu madhukruta. Madhu means we know honey. Madhukrutaha means that which make the honey, which are these bees. 
yeah so yeah somya madhu madhukruto nishtistanti they go around everywhere nanat yayanam vrukshanam what do they do they go to various trees that have flowers in them they go to various trees and what do they do they collect nectars nanat yayanam vrukshanam rasanam samavaharam ekatam rasam gamayanti so they go to every tree different bees go to different trees with flowers they collect the nectar and what do they do they bring the nectar into the bee hive and they and all these nectars they all getting collected and that becomes the honey there is no controversy with what how uddalaka has said now again our rishis were naturalists they knew how the natural environment work so he has taken this example so this bee has gone to various flowers it has collected the nectar and put it into the bee hive and then this each nectar component from different flowers when they are all put together they have become the honey okay now let's think about these honey drops that is there in each honey comb in the bee hive ते यथा तत्र न विवेकम लबन्ते अमुष्याहम वृक्षस्य रसो अस्मि अमुष्याहम वृक्षस्य रसो अस्मि सो दीस इंडिविजुअल नेक्टर्स ड्रॉपलेट्स दैट इज देयर इन द बी हाइव दे डू नॉट नो दैट दे कम फ्रॉम दिस फ्लावर दिस पर्टिकुलर हनी ड्रॉप इन दिस बी इन दिस कोम डस नॉट नो दैट इट हैज कम फ्रॉम दिस लेवर फ्रॉम दिस फ्लावर सिमिलरली this honey drop does not know it has come from this lab from this flower te yata tatra na vivekam labante amushyaham vrikshasya raso asmi amushyaham vrikshasya raso asmi so they do not know how this this nectar drops do not know that they come from this flower evam eva kalu somya imaha sarvaha prajaha similarly my dear son sarvaha prajaha these jeevas do not know that they have come from the sat sati there means sat sat sampadya naviduhu sati sampadyamah iti so what that means is these drops do not know they have come from this flower similarly the jeevas do not know that they have come from this this brahman and at the same time these these nectar droplets that are there in the bee hive they do not even know that they are in the bee hive yeah that is the situation our situation uddalaka you are very close to the supreme all the time exactly the like this nectar which is there in the honey comb so this honey bee hive there is the supreme brahman these individual droplets are the jeevas these individual droplets do not know that they are in this honeycomb they not they do not know they are they are they have taken the ashraya in this in this bee hive so somya imaha sarvaha prajaha sati sampadya naviduhu sati sampadyama iti okay so why they do not know they do not know because of the ignorance yeah so that is what uddalaka is trying to explain with this illustration saying that although the supreme is very close to you you do not know him you are not making an effort to know him because of ignorance what is that ignorance dwasuparna sayuja sakaya samana vriksham say again birds vriksham rishis bring this again and again parishashva jate tayor anyaha pippalam swadati anashna nanyaha abichakashiti because this fellow jeeva bird he has got ignorance covered everywhere so he does not even know that there is this bird which is next to him the examples here is the droplet of nectar and the bee hive in which it is in and at the same time these jeevas when they were in during creation before creation where were they they were inside the womb of the supreme and during creation what's happened they have come from the supreme they still don't know that that they have come from the supreme yeah why is that we have done that in shrimad bhagavatam about the sixth stage of creation where tamasah sarge so there is the ignorance that comes in so uddalaka by this example when he look at the bunny the, the honey and the bee hives he is giving an illustration to bring home the truth about ignorance how the honey droplets do not know that they come this from this flower how the honey drops do not know they are actually in this bee hive such is the situation of the jeevas 
because of their ignorance and to illustrate this further he says because of that ignorance what is happening to these humans and that is important for us because you know uh, as i said initially when we started this navadware when we spoke about this we said this is the sadhana sharira this is the body that we have by which we gain knowledge and you know the supreme but if we have this ignorance and we amplify our ignorance and we do not even make an act and to understand the truths to not gain knowledge that ignorance gets amplified and when you are eventually gone from this world you have not even spent the last 70 or 80 years that you are going to be alive to know understand the truth and you live your life in ignorance and make you don't make use of the sadhana sharira that you have then what happens ta ih vyagro va simho va vruko va vruko va varo varaho va kito va patango va damsho va mashako va yad yad bhavanti tat tada bhavanti so shuddhalaka tells him the fellows who don't make an attempt to gain knowledge who are constantly in ignorance what happens to them they either become tigers lions the ferocious one that go and kill people or they become cunning people like cunning animals like fox or they become dirty animals like pigs or they become the, the, the very sorry states of worms or they become flies or they become mosquitoes or they become house flies all the things that he is seeing in the forest remember uddalaka is in the forest and he is seeing all this and he says that is what they become because they they are not making an attempt to gain that knowledge and in that process they go through the cycles of birth and death of different forms of life and we know that 840000 species that is described in bhagavatam why because of the ignorance what is that ignorance very similar to madhu the honeys and the bee hive and the flowers and that is the answer uddalaka as to why although this bird is very close to the pillar it still does not recognize that this pillar is very close to it okay so again next what he says saya eshani ma itad atmam idam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tatvam asi shvete keto so there how do you say atma atatvam asi you are not that supreme being from whom you have come you are not the supreme being who is who is like the bee hive that is holding you yeah you are not him yeah although you are inside him tasmin there it becomes atma tasmin tvamasi you are inside him atma tasmat tvamasi you are here because of him but still you are not the same person as him atatvamasi shvete keto shed your ego shvete keto because you are not him you did not create the universe you do not control any damn thing all that is is you are inside him you are because of him that is why tatvam asi in that honeycomb example so again the beauty of this verse is this honeycomb if you look at the honey and where they are in the bee hive they are there yeah so that gives you an idea of what taitre upanishad talks about you know there is a famous verse that talks about the creatorship of the supreme yato va imani bhutani jayante yena jatani jivanti yat prayanti abhisamvishanti tad vijignasasva tad brahme look at those two words jivanti abhisamvishanti so so this brahman and jiva combination is is always there this brahman is always with jiva throughout their careers not only in samsara but also in moksha he is always there this brahman is like the honeycomb and the jiva is like the honey droplet so this brahman is always there with the jiva through jivanti through that he maintains them during their samsara and at the same time when they are in moksha also he is there he is always there with you so when taitare upanishad talks about this we need to remind ourselves of how these examples actually fall into place okay 
So we move on to the third illustration, but I don't think we have time today. We'll deal with the third illustration next week. I want to finish this series over the next consecutive three or four weeks with this illustration, because the sequence of thought process of Uddalaka is amazing and giving us great philosophies, looking at all the things that he sees around him. So the core message from the second example is, ignorance of our origin and our relationship with the Supreme is the fundamental reason why we are in samsara, is also the fundamental reason, Shweta Keto, why you think you are such a knowledgeable person, you are standing in front of me like a pillar. Okay, so at this point of time, our Shweta Keto being a university student who has got, you know, who's got the first rank in his Gurukula, he is immediately asking a, a very sensible question, and uh, that question may also occur to some of us. But honey is a non-living thing, right? Honey is a jada. How can it know that it has come from this flower, or how can it know that it is there in the beehive? That is not possible because the honey is a jada or a non-living thing. Is the is what Shweta Ketu pretends to be clever. He thinks he is very clever by asking his son his father this question but that is the doubt that he has very similar to the doubt that we may have the intention of uddalaka there is to introduce the concept of ignorance in the second example and he will develop and evolve that concept of ignorance as to how it happens to sentient beings in the third example so to so the son asks puya eva ma bhagavan vignapayatvaiti tata somya Iti ho vacha. Okay, I'll clarify your doubt. We don't have today to talk about this, but I'll just recite that verse and next week we'll catch this verse. Again, it is one of those beautiful verses that celebrates the rivers of India. Yeah. Imaha somya nadyaha purastat prachyaha syandante paschat prachistastaha samudrat samudrameva apiyanti sa samudra eva bhavati tayata tatrana viduhu I am Ihamasmi, I am Ihamasmi iti, Yeva meva kalusomya, Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sata agamyana viduhu, Sata agachamaha iti, the Iha Vyagrova, Simhova, Vrukova, Varahova, Kitova, Patangova, Damshova, Mashakova, Yet Yet Bavanti, Tada Bavanti. He gives this third illustration talking about the rivers because he's in the forest, he's seeing rivers. He's actually, his hermitage is by the river. And he talks about how the rivers go and merge in the sea, how they go enter into the sea and how that happens and how from that you can understand these truths about how we are ignorant. Okay, we'll deal with that in the third, in the next week, taking up the third illustration and probably we'll move to the fourth, which is even more amazing. So, what Uddalaka does is with every step, he elevates the philosophy and then he reaches the highest levels in the ninth example that we will see over the next three weeks. So I'm going to stop there for today uh, and we will continue next week. Krishna Pranamastu and we can pick up any questions for discussion. Thank you so much. So, uh, any questions? I have uh, uh, Lata Sindhil who had raised her hands. Uh, Lata ji, if you're there, uh, please uh, come on board to ask any questions you may have. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant, stunning. It just takes you to another dimension altogether. Thank you so much. And I put the hand up um, through the discussion. I mean, there's so much I know and I don't know. It's kind of like really beautiful. But the one simple question is like, can you expand on the word asu, please? I think uh, in, in the tat and tatwam and then asi. Yeah. You don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So definitely, Lataji. So, so the asi there. So asi means if you if you take the let's, let's look at tatwam asi. If you look at colloquial Sanskrit, tat twam asi. So when the there is twam, there will always be asi. Yeah. Twam asi means you are there. Asi means in collocation is there. Yeah. Thou art that art. You are there. You are like that. So that's how it is in one view. But 
the Vedic Sanskrit is fully etymological. So it, it just does not have the superficial meanings. It's always etymology. It's got an origin. It's got, for example, you know, the next verse of Nadi. We all know what the etymology of Nadi is. We'll deal with that next time. Similarly, Asu has got a history. It's got etymology. So that Asu, and then if you take Aham Brahma Asmi, that Asmi, for example, is also etymological. So here, Asu, Asi is the etymology. There is Asu Prerane. Asu Prerane means that which is the controller. Yeah. Whereas if you take asmi in aham brahmasmi, that is called asti iti meyam. That is the etymology of asmi there. Asti iti meyam means that which, which knows that it is aham and it is brahma. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. is the expansion. So here asi means asu prerane, that which is a controller, is the etymology of that word. So some schools of thought will actually take asi from that perspective rather than just the superficial meaning of thou art that. Mm -hmm. It would take us thou is an, that is a name of God, thwam is a name of God, asi is a name of God. So this whole verse, in this whole verse of 12 that he has described plus these three, so the 15 words celebrate the names of the Supreme is one interpretation. Hope that, that is Perfect. understandable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Pratibhaji had raised her hands, I think. Namaskar. It's it so wonderful. I was just having one ignorant doubt. This B, B is the body which carries the honey. And we could assume that B is the our body which is carrying the jiva. And the jiva is inside the beehive. And uh, we, we are not able to recognize. That's how it is. Yeah, yeah. So that, that yeah, that's very interesting uh, way of looking at it, uh, Pratibhaji. You can take the bee as a as a sentient being, and there is the honey. Yeah, that is possible. But Uddalaka's intention there is to introduce the concept of ignorance in its grossest form, in its very basic form. That ignorance is what he is introducing. But next example takes it a bit more. You know, you're talking about your bees, which are sentient beings. He talks about nadis and nadis. You know, Indian rivers have all got names of goddesses, right? Ganga, Yamuna, Gangotri, uh, ba ba Bhagirathi. They're all the names of various, uh, you know, goddesses, the, uh, demigods that we have in the Vedic pantheon. So we will take and deal with that from that angle. But I, I get your point. It's an interesting angle. Thank you. Namaskar. Harish, uh, Madhu, uh, just uh, one question. I may, again, uh, some ignorance more than more than anything. But uh, uh, when you gave the example of the uh, post and the bird, uh, that's not quite the you know the sadrsha analogy, right? So I just wanted to you know maybe uh, reconcile that for me. Yeah. So the example there is not about sadrsha. The example there is about the dependence. How dependence. the bird is entirely dependent to the through the sutra, it is tied to the post and it is totally dependent. It is talking about the dependence, but that dependence also then comes in Bimba Prati Bimba Bhava of the object and the image where that concept of Sadrisha gets developed. So you just build it up. Okay. okay. And one other uh, question uh, is, uh, is uh, do we, either of the philosophies, uh, you know, support this notion that uh, you know, you're, you're similar to the Brahman in terms of quant quality, but not in quantity. I don't know if that's something that you've, you've come across. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, even in quality, uh, okay, so there is a whole mile. Uh, it, it again depends on the school of thought, uh, Harish. There is one school of thought which would say, uh, you are you are so tiny and you are so small. You are nowhere near Brahman. So that is one view. Yeah. So that would be, for example, the Dvaita view would be. You are. He is different. You are different. You may have some similarity. What is your similarity? You may. You are both sentient beings. So in that perspective, there is some similarity. And what is the other similarity? When you are, you are both indestructible. You you are both not. You, you both have always been there forever. Krishna talks about it, as you know, in the second chapter. So that is another similarity. And then when jivas attain moksha, then they are there eternally forever. So that is another similarity. That the other type of similarity is jnanananda. So you have your own quanta of jnana and ananda. And this fellow is infinite ananda, jnana ananda. 
so that is there is some resemblance but you, you he is in a totally different angle so that's what purusha shukta says right tripad urdva udait purushaha yad annena atirohati so when you look at all those words in in the rigveda it's it's very clearly it says he is atirohati he is entirely different species he is entirely different and you are different but there is some similarity so that is where the similarity stops and it, it that is from the dualistic school or the dvaita school then you have the visishta dvaita school visishta dvaita school view is in moksha so once you have attained liberation the amount of the amount of eternal bliss that brahman has and the amount of bliss that the jiva has is the same is the view of visishta dvaita in moksha okay that is where the the concepts are slightly different and then if you come to advaita where there is nothing called the jiva and there is nothing called the brahman both are the same it is some avidya that somehow comes in and separates brings that avidya is the one that makes a nirguna brahman to saguna brahman and also jivas and uh, the whole philosophy is around that in advaita school so these are the three strands of it it's up to us whoever uh, whatever appeals to you you can take it on but that is the view that is out there but one extreme uh, view is totally different same similar and i am the same so that is uh, how the vedanta has uh, evolved harish i hope it explains it, it does thank you thank you so much thank you namaste namaste sudarshan ji um um this is jagdish i have a quick question on the slide going back to the first slide of the bees and uh, um honeycomb um so there is one sentence uh, you talked about the one be- the, the first one that you had the two slides before this one the second uh, uh yes the, the second stanza we have the word um raso mia so you have that word twice um i know um, upanishads and veda would not put a word twice unless there is a very significant in um putting that uh, sentence there so what any particular significance as we having that raso mia uh, i can't see i'm sorry yeah so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a excellent observation jagadish ji i think the so the open so the upanishads and vedas will repeat twice on two different occasions yeah the first one is if they are completing in in vedic literature there is no full stop so you don't have a full stop to say okay now i've finished this section and i'm going to the next section or i'm going to the next chapter or this particular work is coming to an end so for example in brahma sutra the 564th aphorism is anavrittir shabdat anavrittir shabdat so that is repeated twice so when it is repeated twice then you will know that this is now finished this particular work is over so when it is put twice one meaning is that particular work is over or if you put it twice means stressing the point that this is important this is something that you need to understand that, that something you need to give close attention to yeah so that is the second way of looking at it and the third uh, in this particular example if you look at the previous line it says what yatasomya madhu madukruto nishtistanti nanat yayanam vrikshanam rasanam samavaharam ekatam gamayanti rasam gamayanti yeah so uh, it 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 then goes what say te yata tatra na vivekam labante amushyaham rikshasya raso asmi amushyaham rikshasya raso asmi so that is where it comes twice right. that is to illustrate look how ignorant it is it does not know that it is coming from this hun- this particular flower it is coming from this particular flower look at that stress that sentence why is that happening because of ignorance yeah it is to stress that concept it comes twice oh okay oh okay. thank you thank you yeah. thank you jinesh any other questions okay so if there are no further questions again thank you so much for joining us again this uh, evening so we will uh, catch up again next sunday to go into the third examples please read up about the indian rivers because there are a few questions that i've got to study about the names of indian rivers and so on 
and then we will enter into the fourth example as well. So on that note, we will finish today's session. Harish, do you want to take us through uh, Om, please? Sure. Om. Thank you, Badaji. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.